Since the agricultural revolution, humans have evolved well beyond the apex predator. We have the ability to affect any and every environment or species we want. Even the ability to make some extinct. However, by the end of World War II, we discovered the ability to wipe ourselves out 10 times over. On July 6, 1945, the world's first nuclear bomb was dropped in Los Alamos, New Mexico, in the classified government program called the Manhattan Project. The level of destruction became apparent, estimating the first explosion being equal to 25 kilotons of TNT. Would not be the same. Three weeks later, the United States dropped two more atomic bombs in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The aftermath of the explosions was even more horrifying. The creation of the atomic bomb brought a new era to the world. These children are protected. Concrete walls help stop radioactivity. It brought a new kind of fear that haunted the minds of people for decades. It can win only when everyone knows his job and does it well. That at any second, we could bring our own doomsday. Now, while this video is about the Doomsday Clock, there is a bit of a history behind it that I'll need to explain. When the Los Alamos scientists created the atomic bomb, its destructive capability became clear to the scientists and have been actively against its widespread use. Now, even though they did create it, these scientists didn't make them in hopes that they will be used someday. The program was put underway because the US was under competition with Nazi Germany. The compelling reason for creating the atomic bomb with such speed was our fear that Germany had the technical skill necessary to develop such a weapon, and that the German government had no moral restraints regarding its use. After Germany's defeat, the US had uncovered the fact that Germany had not been able to produce any atomic weapons. That was when scientists started to take a stand against it. And when there were talks about using the bombs against Japan, these same scientists felt obligated to take action. For the first time in modern history, scientists were saying that it was necessary to make judgment about what to do with their inventions. Before the bombings of Japan, Henry Stimson developed a secret high-level group on behalf of President Truman called the Interim Committee. The group was made up of 17 different individuals that was also split up into multiple different subsections. The goal of the committee was to discuss the proper use of atomic weapons and to develop the United States position on post-war atomic policy. But most importantly, if and how they should use the atomic bombs against Japan. During the debate, it was clear that there were two contrasting viewpoints. The people on the scientific panel leaned against using the bomb, while the advisory group wanted a quick end to finish the war. On the scientific advisory side, Ernest Lawrence suggested that a demonstration of the bomb would be more than sufficient enough to convince Japan to surrender. Lawrence believed if they used the bomb as a threat, like a gun to their head, and told them to surrender or they drop it, it might work. This plan was further backed by another group of scientists at the Los Alamos site and members of METLAB who felt their voices weren't heard in the decision making and felt morally compelled to take action. Together, these and 70 additional scientists formed the Committee on the Social and Political Implications of the Atomic Bomb, or for short, the Gotsabio Tab. Nah, th that's not true. The group sent a report to the Secretary of War discussing their concerns about the bomb. In the document, they talked about their fears of an inevitable arms race and their future recommendations on how to prevent it. But let's say, with the head start that the US has, they were able to develop an impressive stockpile of weapons that triumph over other rivaling countries. If, say, a rivaling country were to develop even a small arsenal of missiles, that country could cleverly launch them into critical areas and permanently paralyze the US. Adding on to that, if nuclear armaments are allowed to develop, expected improvements on the bomb could make them even more effective. At present, it may be that the atomic bomb can be detonated with an effect equal to that of 20,000 tons of TNT, 
One of these bombs could then destroy something like three square miles of an urban area. Atomic bombs containing a larger quantity of active material but still weighing less than one ton may be expected to be available within 10 years, which could destroy over 10 square miles of a city. A nation able to assign 10 tons of atomic explosives for a sneak attack on this country can then hope to achieve the destruction of all industry and most of the population in an area from 500 square miles upwards. They also discussed the problems with using the bomb against Japan and suggested Lawrence's plan of a demonstration instead. The military advantages and the saving of American lives achieved by the sudden use of the atomic bombs against Japan may be outweighed by the ensuing loss of confidence and by a wave of horror. From this point of view, a demonstration of a new weapon might be best made before eyes of representations of all of the United Nations. America could say to the world, you see what sort of weapon we had but did not use? We are ready to renounce its use in the future if other nations join us in its renunciation and agree to the establishment of efficient control. However, this plan was rejected for multiple reasons. One, they believed the bomb could be a possible dud. At this point, they hadn't developed a bomb yet, and the first scheduled test was about two months away. They had no idea whether it'd be a success and wouldn't want to give out information like that until after they had used it. Another concern was Japan could have American POWs in some of the target areas, or Japan could shoot down the plane before it reached drop zone. While the committee did take in consideration the group's plea, they weren't without reason to use the bomb. At the time, the closest America was to mainland Japan was Okinawa, which was still well over 400 miles away, and getting control of the island wasn't easy either. The Battle of Okinawa was the Pacific's most deadliest battle, with more than 240,000 US soldiers, Japanese soldiers, and Okinawa citizens dying. Even though it was the deadliest battle in the Pacific, the battle could have served as an introduction to the possible millions of casualties both countries could face, should an inland assault were to be enacted. To the other members of the committee, the bomb appeared as an escape from the inevitable bloodbath. Ultimately, the committee concluded that the bomb would be dropped without warning and would remain a secret. Other further plans in the Frank report were dismissed, not only by the committee, but members of the scientific committee viewing it as too optimistic. I'm not supporting or arguing their decisions by any means, I'm only stating what happened. After the bombings and the end of the war, the same scientists that signed the Frank report still felt an obligation to inform the public about its dangers. These scientists would then go on to create the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. The creation of the group was to equip the public, policymakers, and scientists with the information needed to reduce man made threats to our existence. It started as a newspaper outlet that would send out reports on the state of the world with the world's most current events. The first one was posted in mid-December 1945, near the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, where they compared the tragedy with other potential dangers. 3,000 Americans lost their lives in the Japanese sneak attack. 30 million Americans may be doomed if a sneak attack on our cities by atomic bomb ever comes to pass. They would continue to publish multiple volumes of important events, such as Volume 3, Note 4, where they would discuss the Truman Doctrine, which would help foreign nations from authoritarian control and the spread of communism, or Volume 1, Note 5, where they discussed Operation Crossroads. The classified program's main purpose was primarily to determine the effects of the atomic bomb on naval vessels in order to gain information of value to the national defense. If you've never heard of Operation Crossroads, you've definitely seen it before. <laughs> However, the idea of the Doomsday Clock wouldn't be conceptualized until Volume 3, Note 6, where one of the most iconic journal covers is formed. The journal cover was designed by Martel Langsdorf, who was also married to Alexander Langsdorf, one of the 70 scientists who signed the Frank Report. At the time, the bulletin was starting to gain more traction with their reports, and eventually wanted to change the design like a magazine. When Alexander brought up that his wife was a graphic designer and an artist, they had her take lead in the design. 
When Martel was designing the cover, she originally wanted to use the symbol U for uranium. However, after talking to many of the scientists, the gravity of the situation became apparent. And having the cover be that didn't seem appropriate enough to describe the urgency. There, she switched it to a minimalistic design of a clock, and the rest is history. At this point, I feel I should talk about how the clock works. As I stated before, the clock counts down to doomsday, or midnight. The closer the minute hand gets to midnight, the more dire the situation becomes, while being farther away means we're more safe. And while it was first created to signify nuclear threats, it has since broadened its scope to other man-made threats such as climate change or biological weapons. The clock doesn't move linearly like it does for time. If for one year the clock was at 3 minutes, it can always go back to 10 minutes, and then again go forward to 5. The clock's time only signifies how close we are to annihilation. However, that being said, the only time that rule was broken was when Martel first designed it. 7 minutes looked good to my eye. It was only two more years and several journal covers later did the clock start to have any symbolic meaning. What? Three minutes? But what happened? What would cause it to come so close? Well, on September 3rd, 1949, CIA Chief Roscoe Hillencoletter sent a report to President Truman. A weather reconnaissance aircraft was taking a routine flight from Misawa Air Force Base to Ellison Air Force Base, Alaska. These weather planes were equipped with special filters that could detect radioactive debris, and as they were flying back, their systems detected radioactivity. At first, they didn't think anything of it because radiation can occur naturally. However, after multiple routine flights back and forth collecting samples, they realized the area was... odd. In the report Roscoe sent, he stated that there was abnormal radioactive contamination in the area. At first, many believed that it could have been possible volcanic activity in northern Japan or radioactive gases being swept up from Washington to Alaskan air currents. It was only later that the CIA was able to confirm that it was indeed an atomic explosion in Russia. Once it was confirmed, Truman announced their discoveries on the 23rd of September. I believe the American people, to the fullest extent consistent with national security, are entitled to be informed of all developments in the field of atomic energy. That is my reason for making public the following information. We have evidence that within recent weeks an atomic explosion occurred in the USSR. Now it should be stated that it's no surprise that Russia was able to develop one, with the Los Alamos scientists even stating this all the way back in the Frank report. The fundamental facts of nuclear power are subject of common knowledge. Many scientists in Britain and France had aided in the progress of nucleonics and the assembly of the bomb. They know just as much as we do in terms of its creation. The basic facts and implications of nuclear power were well understood in 1940, and many countries could retrace America's steps within a few years even if we should make every attempt to conceal them. Back in Truman's report, he also stated this as well. Ever since atomic energy was first released by man, the eventual development of this new force by other nations was to be expected. This probably has always been taken into account by us. Truman even told Stalin himself about the bomb during the Potsdam conference. Although, at the time, Stalin's response was fairly unreactive, so much so that Truman thought that Stalin's interpreter might have misspoken. Across the room, I watched Stalin's face carefully as the president broke the news. So offhand was Stalin's response that there was some question in my mind whether the president's message had got through. It came as no surprise to the US that the Soviets were able to develop the atomic bomb. What was surprising was how fast they were able to develop it. In the bulletin's 1949 report, they stated, it is admitted that the Soviet bomb explosion came two or three years earlier than our planners expected. Everyone believed that America had a much longer head start than they were given. They figured Russia would have it by 52 or 53, but not 49. That was way too fast. The bomb the Soviets were able to develop was called RDS-1, codenamed First Lightning by the Soviets and Joe one by the Americans. RDS-1 was developed as an implosion-type device, a lot like the US's Fat Man. RDS-1 also had a solid plutonium core, specifically made of plutonium-239, 
also a lot like the U.S.'s Fat Man. And the bomb was made three years earlier than expected. Wait a second. Did they copy it? Yeah, you heard that right. The Soviets managed to get their hands on the blueprints to America's A-bomb. No wonder Stalin seemed so calm during the conference. That's the face of the man who knows your state secrets. But how did they find out? During the early 1940s, Soviets sent NKVD spies to America where they would try to uncover information that could serve the Soviet Union. Three of the more notable spies were Anatoly Yatskov, or his American name Anatoly Yatskovelv, Heinrich Golodinsky, or his American name Harry Gold, and Alexander Feklazov, or his American name Alexander Fahman. The three worked at a Soviet consulate office that was stationed in New York, where they worked as Russian embassy workers, but also recruited espionage agents that could send important information back to Russia. The case they were best known for was the atomic spy ring. The small group would recruit scientists or government workers who were a part of the Los Alamos project or any other affiliation relating to it. Some of the more notable ones were David Greenglass, who was a machinist on the project, who sent out multiple sketches of the mechanisms of the bomb. Another was Klaus Fuchs, who is credited as the most vital source of information to the Soviets. Fuchs alone has influenced the safety of more people and accomplished greater damage than any other spy, not only in the history of the United States, but in the history of nations. It is believed that the information that Fuchs gave to the Soviets had saved them as much as six months to three years worth of work. It was only until 1950 that the atomic spy ring was caught through the Verona intercepts. Verona was a counterintelligence program that would decrypt intelligence agencies' information from Russia. In the files, they were able to discover many of the spies that were in the Los Alamos projects, starting with Klaus. After interrogating Klaus, he later confessed and confessing to other conspirators, such as Harry and Greenglass. They were also able to uncover other spies, such as Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. In the encrypted data, they would use Julius's codename, Liberal. What caught him is that they didn't use Ethel's codename. In some of the recordings, they addressed her by her name, Ethel. Another one they were able to uncover was Theodore Hall because of his codename Mlad. In Russian, Mlad means young, and at the time during the Los Alamos project, Theodore was 19. These confirmed reports of espionage led to a greater fear in the public, influenced the doomsday clock. Now, while it was only confirmed until 1950 that there were spies in the Los Alamos project, the US had already suspected that espionage had taken place. The bulletin even added their suspicions in the 1949 report. Almost unanimously, our statesmen and commentators have told us that although the Soviet scientists may have cracked, or as some have insinuated, their spies may have stolen. And with the discussion of an Atlantic PAC army with many of the Western powers allying, that led to the bulletin's conclusion of having the clock be at three minutes. With the help of Klaus Fuchs, he not only aided in leaking the documents of the atomic bomb, but also documents of a theoretical super bomb, detailing concepts that, at the time, haven't been developed yet. The information provided created the Soviet's first hydrogen bomb, RDS-6S. The achievement of a thermonuclear explosion by the Soviet Union, following on the heels of the development of the thermonuclear devices in America, means that the time dreaded by scientists since 1945, when each major nation will hold the power of destroying at will the urban civilization of any other nation, is close at hand. Now even though the Soviets had a thermonuclear bomb, the threat wasn't its destructive power. By comparing the Soviets' RDS with the Americans' first hydrogen bomb, Operation Ivy or Mike, the destructive capability of Mike towers in comparison, being 25 times more powerful. The US could still develop an even more powerful bomb any day of the week. The fear came to the fact that RDS was much lighter. 
At the time of peak hydrogen bomb development, it could only be exploded by towers because the bombs weighed dozens of tons. Even if you could make the most powerful missile in the world, it's useless if you can't even move it outside of your own country. However, RDS was so light that it had the potential to be dropped by plane. The gadget will soon be converted into an H-bomb capable of delivery by bomber. Given enough time, the bomb could be developed to be measurable in the megatons. This shouldn't downplay the current capabilities of RDS-6 though. Compared to the Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the current bomb is still 20 times more destructive. And with the continued growth of each country's nuclear arsenal, it led to a decade-long period of fear. And then it wasn't. For the next decade, Americans and Soviets began establishing threats to each other. Over time, a easy recognizable pattern started to form. In 1956, pressure started to rise around the Suez Canal. The strait connects the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, allowing easy access for trade for Europe and Southeast Asia, making the channel extremely valuable. The strait also has the potential to develop profits through tolls. Considering the next best alternative to the Suez would be to travel across Africa, it appeared to be the only viable route. So it's safe to say, whoever owns the Suez could make a lot of money. While back, Britain controlled Egypt. However, in 1922, Britain gave Egypt its independence, with a few exceptions. Britain and France get to maintain control of the Suez. Now that was all fine and dandy until 1956, where there was one Egyptian president named Gamal Abdel Nasser. Previously, the US and Britain were going to finance a new Aswan Dam that would help control the Nile floodwater and provide electricity and water to Egyptian people. But they didn't do this, they backed out, and Gamal couldn't find the funds to this dam. He couldn't until he looked a bit more north at the Suez and saw all the profits Britain were making. So he promptly seized control. After this, British, French, and Israeli forces invaded Egypt to try and gain control back and reopen the strait. However, Egypt has friends in high places, with Premier Nikita Khrushchev threatening nuclear war on the Western world if they don't leave Egypt. America also threatened economic sanctions on Britain, France, and Israel if they didn't leave as well. Ultimately, they gave in, and Egypt gained control over the Suez. Okay. Not an obvious pattern right now, so I'll give another. On the other side of the world, there was the second Taiwan Strait Crisis. On one side, you had the Republic of China, or the Chinese Nationalists, and on the other side, you have the People's Republic of China, or the Chinese Communists. If you've been watching the news recently, you'll know that China doesn't really like Taiwan. China doesn't think Taiwan's a real country and for years have been trying to possess it. This time isn't that different. Just three miles south of the coast of mainland China is a set of Taiwanese-owned islands called the Kamoi Islands. In 1958, China started to send artillery rounds to these islands, trying to separate it from the main island. Taiwan, defenselessly, asked its big brother, the United States, for help. The US, in turn, sent a blockade of ships around the subset of islands to prevent China from taking any further actions. If there were any further provocations, America considered it may need to use one of their atomic bombs. However, again, Khrushchev intervened and reached out to Eisenhower, stating that the war with Taiwan and China was a strictly internal affair. And if the US intervened, an attack on China would be considered an attack on the Soviet Union. Eventually, China agreed to have a ceasefire that would last a couple of weeks, if the US stopped its blockade. After the few weeks were up, China said it would fire its artillery again, but only on even numbered days, for some reason. And this went on until almost the 80s when it promptly ended. Essentially, either the US or Russia would be involved in some foreign affair. When one of these countries got involved, the other would point its gun at the other saying, hey, if you kill him, I'll kill you. 
kind of like a weird Mexican standoff. Then after the heat dies down, then they start lowering their guns. This would go on for the Lebanon crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so on, with the bulletin pinning the term Berkmanship onto it. 